Welcome to KTVU Crime Files, not only reporting on Bay Area crime, but also offering advice for solutions. San Francisco's mayor says her efforts to reduce crime are paying off, but the candidates challenging Breed for her seat in November have different opinions. KTVU's Christian Captain tells us the latest data shows crime is on the decline. In a city that has had more than its fair share of headlines about crime, the latest data show that crime in San Francisco is dropping. The mayor's office releasing statistics showing property crime is down 32% over the first three months of last year, and violent crime is down 14%, including zero homicides in the month of February. Every arrow is pointing down, whether it's burglaries, car break-ins, um, you name it, rapes, anything that's happening in a major city like San Francisco, it's been incredible. The mayor's office credits the city's collaboration with state and federal law enforcement partners and a district attorney's office that holds criminals accountable once they're arrested. We are putting everything that we have at our disposal to good use and the numbers, the data reflect it. KTVU reached out to those challenging the mayor for her seat in November. Former interim mayor Mark Farrell released a statement reading in part, quote, for many San Franciscans, the anemic progress that the mayor continues to tout is too little, too late. We need a mayor that will deliver real results and change, and that is what I will do on day one. Daniel Lurie also released a statement reading, quote, San Francisco needs a mayor that cares about your safety every day, not just in an election year. Those who live and work in San Francisco are also weighing in about whether they're seeing those signs that the streets are safer. My sense is that that's true, that that data is borne out in my personal experience. I have not felt that extreme threat or concern in a long time. I think it was worse during COVID. I think there were times when it felt really scary to be out on the streets. In terms of safety, I still feel pretty safe, to be honest. I think a lot of people mind their business if you mind their own, but um, I haven't seen so much change, to be honest. The mayor's office says it expects crime to continue to trend downward, especially in light of Proposition E, which passed just last month and would allow police to use new technology to track down criminals. In San Francisco, Christian Kafton, KTVU, Fox 2 News. A recent and rapid rise in assaults on bus drivers prompting one transit agency to take some action. KTV South Bay reporter Jesse Gary live for us this afternoon in San Mateo with what's being done and also, Jesse, some reaction from frontline workers. Heather, good evening to you. Samtrans operates 71 bus lines here in San Mateo County. The busiest ones are along the El Camino corridor, which is just off to my left. It's here where officials say drivers are facing increasing acts of violence. Samtrans bills itself as the peninsula's public transit connector, but increasingly its bus operators are targets of attack. The driving part, I would say about 20% of the job and the 80% is dealing with the public. That's what makes it very difficult. 22 year employee Ernie Solero is not only a union president, but also a bus operator. He says the district's 320 drivers routinely face verbal and physical assaults with some passengers even spitting on them. Sometimes it's just uh, like uh, over the, the fair dispute. And also when the operator just tried to uh, enforce uh, the, the rules when I was telling her not to lie down the bus so other passengers can actually use the seat and she just kind of ran towards me. Solero escaped that encounter without harm, but it wasn't an outlier. According to Sam Trans, a handful of such incidents from 2018 to 2022 spiked last year. There were 14 cases of assaults against bus operators in 2023. This mirrors a national trend that's really concerning. And so it's our mission to prevent as many of these assaults as we possibly can. The district is installing see-through protective barriers around the driver's compartment to help reduce the risk of violence. Additionally, Samtran's board days ago approved enacting a new code of conduct and enforcement policy. It applies to all passengers and members of the public. The policy targets behaviors including harassment, discrimination, fare evasion, physical and verbal assault, and carrying or using weapons. Violators can be removed from a Sam Tram's vehicle and be banned from future use for a defined or indefinite period of time. I would really think it's going to make a whole lot of difference with our bus operators, especially for our female operators. 
So far this year, officials say there have been four assaults on Sam Trans buses, which is below the national average, at least so far. The petitions we mentioned are being installed right now. That work should be completed in the next three months. As for the code of conduct, that'll be active once it is posted to the Sam Trans website. We're live in San Mateo this evening. Jesse Gary, KTVU, Fox 2 News. Heather, back up to you. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if those things do, in fact, work. All right, Jesse, thank you. A San Francisco Sheriff's deputy is charged with multiple felonies, including domestic violence. Prosecutors say 40-year-old Deputy Sheriff Jonathan Esperito choked a woman he had been dating when she tried to end the relationship in August. In December, he allegedly attacked her at her workplace. The victim reported the abuse last week after she found a tracking device on her vehicle. Esperito pleaded not guilty to two counts of domestic violence as well as assault, false imprisonment, stalking and other charges. He is being held without bail pending trial. District Attorney Brooke Jenkins said in a statement, I would like to thank the survivor in this case for coming forward and reporting these crimes to law enforcement. My office will now do everything we can to ensure that there is accountability and that justice is served. KTVU Fox 2 News at 5 starts now. Now at five, law enforcement agencies playing catch up to a string of sideshows across the Bay Area from the Bay Bridge to now even small cities not known to be home to such dangerous activity. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Meebeck. And I'm Heather Holmes. That series of sideshows wreaked havoc around the Bay Area this weekend. One did block the Bay Bridge, another injured a bystander, and a third damaged a police vehicle. Much of the chaos occurred on the peninsula in towns and cities that rarely see these sideshows. KTV's Ann Rubin live for us now in Mountain View. And Ann, the concern is sideshows are moving from places that crack down on them to towns that haven't yet. Yeah, that's right. So there is now a big push from some of these smaller departments to band together to investigate these as they happen and to work together on them afterwards. This was the scene in Menlo Park Saturday. Screeching tires, a massive crowd, and a lone police officer who happened to see it all unfold. As soon as the officer got there, people started to surround the officer's vehicle, blind him uh, with laser pointers, and started to uh, hit and kick his patrol car causing a, a, a window to break. This photo shows the damage. Thankfully, the officer was not injured. But as the sideshow moved down the peninsula to Palo Alto and then to Mountain View, a spectator wasn't so lucky. A 20-year-old suffered a broken ankle when she was hit by a spinning car. These types of activities are incredibly dangerous, not just to responding officers, but to the entire public at large and to the participants who are involved in them. That's why there's a massive crackdown underway. Places like San Jose have a special sideshow protocol involving air support, 100 officers, and an ordinance that allows bystanders to be cited. And in San Joaquin County, they have a zero tolerance approach. They've decided to seize cars as evidence and hold them indefinitely. I wouldn't waste your time coming out here or calling about your car because it's going to sit until a judge or the DA tells us to let it go. Authorities are waiting to see the impact of all this. I think that that action will absolutely tend to move that sideshow to a different location. In this case, to a place like Menlo Park that rarely sees them. Once we know it's happening here, we're going to let surrounding agencies know because that activity tends to move from place to place, as it did on Saturday night. Eventually, sideshow activity moved to Oakland and then to the Bay Bridge, where it blocked all traffic. Ultimately, CHP detained four people. But Menlo Park says this investigation is far from over. I don't think they believe that they're off the hook. I think most of the people who are engaging in this kind of activity, they, they know how dangerous it is. They try to take measures to make themselves anonymous, and we take measures to try to identify as many of these folks as we can. Authorities say everything from license plate readers to video can be helpful in trying to identify the people responsible, and they say more arrests and seizure warrants might be coming in the near weeks. Mike? And Ruben live tonight in Mountain View. And thank you. New at 10 tonight, we are hearing from the CHP on its efforts to combat the fentanyl crisis in San Francisco. The governor's office released new numbers today, crediting the CHP with taking more than nine and a half million lethal doses of fentanyl off the streets since May of last year. KTVU's Joey Horta live in San Francisco with the results of the ongoing operation. Joey. Well, Julie, we spoke to this man who is now a recovery advocate and he was a former fentanyl user. He says, well, 
He applauds what CHP is doing now. Law enforcement to him is only part of the solution. One little dose, as little as two milligrams, could kill you. Fentanyl is a drug Tom Wolf knows all too well. In 2018, he was living in the streets of San Francisco and hooked on both heroin and fentanyl, leading to his arrest. It's a struggle because you'll basically do anything to feed that addiction. New numbers from Governor Gavin Newsom's office on Tuesday show the results of CHP's special operation with the city of San Francisco, targeting the tenderloin and surrounding areas known as a hotspot for open air drug use. This is an operation that has a lot of moving parts. Since May of 2023, CHP has taken more than 40 pounds of fentanyl off the streets. That's more than nine and a half million doses of the drug and made nearly 500 arrests. Driving down the street and we witness uh, you know, a hand-to-hand -hand drug deal. Yes, absolutely, we're going to intervene. CHP's focus is on making traffic stops to help free up San Francisco police resources. The goal, targeting fentanyl trafficking and disrupting the supply chain of a drug that the CDC says is 100 times stronger than morphine. Wolf applauds CHP's operation, but stresses that drug treatment is key. And uh, in June, I'll have six years clean and sober. And that's because I was held accountable. I had to go to jail for a few months to get sober. And then I went to a six month residential treatment program. Wolf now works as a consultant for the Salvation Army's transitional housing program, helping people battling addiction to turn their lives around just like he did. Just need to stop this revolving door that we have uh, with organized drug dealers continuing to be arrested and then getting released to pretrial diversion and they head right back out onto the street to uh, to sell drugs. CHP says their presence in San Francisco is ongoing. And CHP telling us tonight they are here doing this to support San Francisco police in their efforts to fight crime. Police telling us tonight they are thankful for that. Julie. And Joey, did the CHP say how many officers are out patrolling the Tenderloin? Well, we did ask that question, Julie, and they were hesitant to reveal too much of their tactics. They do say, though, again, that they are not leaving here anytime soon. All right, Joey Horta in San Francisco tonight. Joey, thank you. The CHP is looking this morning for the gunman responsible for the latest highway shooting in the Bay Area. It happened in Berkeley during the height of the evening rush hour. Let's go to KTV's James Torres joining us now with what the Highway Patrol is saying about what happened. Good morning, James. Claudine, good morning to you. Well, I-80 was shut down for hours in Berkeley. It's reopened now. You won't find any trouble if you get on the roadway at this point. But last night, it took a lot of time for investigators to walk around and collect their evidence for this investigation. Here's what we know so far. CHP officers came out to eastbound uh, on the eastbound ramp at Ashby Avenue around 5 o'clock last night. They report someone calling 911 saying a driver had been shot by a person in another car. The victim of that shooting crashed their car into a barrier. At this time, we know at least one woman at the hospital. We're continuing to ask at this time that, you know, anybody who might have seen anything, please call us. You know, it's, it's Interstate 80 at 5 o'clock on a Friday. We know there's a lot of vehicles out there. There's a lot of people either, you know, leaving to go home for the weekend or maybe on their way out of town for the weekend. So we're hoping that anybody that was nearby at that time picks up the phone and calls us. CHP says it plans to install 190 license plate readers in the East Bay to help tackle this kind of crime. Police, of course, still investigating this case. They ask if you have any information, be sure to give them a call. Reporting live this morning, I'm James Torres, KTVU, Fox 2 News. A mosque in San Francisco has been vandalized several times in the last week, apparently by the same person. As KTV's Amanda Quintana report, the vandalism has many people in the community asking for more protection. This mosque on Sutter Street has been vandalized at least twice in just the last week. You could see the windows here outside still broken. And this is all while the Muslim community has been participating in Ramadan today, celebrating the end of the holy month. Surveillance video on social media shows a man smashing windows of the mosque with a skateboard. This happened on April 3rd. Then the same man reportedly came back yesterday. He ended up breaking more windows and then went into the mosque yelling Islamophobic rhetoric. He allegedly got into an altercation, threatened people and wrote 
you will burn in hell on the walls. We have a photo showing the words after mosque leaders tried to paint over it. Members of the Muslim community say in this polarizing time, they want more protection. People think that Islamophobia doesn't exist, but in reality, it happens every single day. A lot of, uh, a lot of incidents being unreported. And the truth is that police have other issues to worry about, and we're really asking for them uh, and the city to prioritize the community and make sure that there's more resources and the community is protected. Hala Hajazi, a commissioner with the city's Human Rights Commission, who initially tweeted about these attacks, says the rise of Islamophobic rhetoric, including from public officials, is contributing to violence like this. Today, there are many celebrations for Eid. I'm told that some people, while they are scared, others still feel it's important to celebrate today. In San Francisco, Amanda Quintana, KTVU, yeah. Fox 2 News. Well, tonight, the Oakland Police Department provided its biannual update on staffing levels, saying they are working to try to boost academy numbers. Officials told the city council safety meeting that the department currently has 708 officers on the job. OPD's budget is authorized for 712 officers officers. 74 officers are on leave. The academy also has 14 officers said to graduate next month, one of the smaller classes in recent years. OPD is not unique in the fact that uh, we, along with other law enforcement agencies, have had a difficult time recruiting uh, people into our academies. The city's hiring freeze has also affected 51 non-sworn positions in the police department. The department is set to present its proposed budget to the city administration tomorrow. New at 10, we are hearing from witnesses tonight following a deadly shooting in San Francisco's Mission District. Police say officers were called to Mission near 20th Street just after 1.30 this afternoon where they found the victim. Despite efforts of first responders, that victim died at the scene. KTV's Amber Lee joins us live in San Francisco with the latest developments. Amber? Greg, neighbors tell me the deadly shooting is unsettling. It happened in broad daylight with plenty of people around in a busy commercial area. A resident cleans up the debris outside a residential hotel in San Francisco's Mission District. Shattered glass left from a shooting around 1.40 Friday afternoon that left one man dead. We hear that, that, that chop. Then we come out. Neighbor Jason Flores tells me he heard a single gunshot. Witnesses say the victim was shot outside the barbershop and that he stumbled back inside, collapsed, and died. Neighbors described the victim as being in his 20s and that he was from Venezuela. They say it was the victim's first day at work in the barbershop. It's terrible, though, because, you know, if he dies, the guy, when he shoot, the bullet can go straight right there. Flores says, fortunately, no one else was injured. This is a busy area, Mission Street between 19th and 20th Streets. Witnesses say the suspect fled the scene in a white SUV that was parked steps from the shooting. When I came, I see a lot of police over there. I like to see the... They close the, the street. Abel Padilla is the owner of La Playa Seafood, a restaurant a few doors down from the shooting. Padilla grew up in this neighborhood and opened the business just two months ago. This is the first time I hear that happens right here. So, to me, you say. Still, business owners say they'd like to see police do foot patrols in the area. It's terrible. I never see something like that close to me. Police have not said if the victim and suspect knew each other or what the motive was. Investigators have not released a description of the suspect or the getaway vehicle. Greg? All right. Amber Lee live in the mission for us tonight. Amber, thank you. State lawmakers from both sides of the aisle are now working together in an effort to curb retail theft. A package of seven bills was announced today that address smash and grabs from the arrest to prosecution. But as KTV's Henry Lee explains now, this new legislation does not make changes to the controversial Prop 47. As you guys know, our retailers have uh, gone many years and have been asking for the help, and I think that's what we're here to do today. A bipartisan push in Sacramento to crack down on organized retail theft. Politicians from both sides of the aisle working together to craft seven bills to put an end to snatch and grabs like these. This bill says to organize crime rings, we mean business, and we're going to give law enforcement the tools they need to shut you down. 
Taken together, the bills would allow law enforcement to combine similar thefts from different victims into one grand theft case in certain cases, allow DAs to pool resources across jurisdictions, and result in stiffer penalties and restraining orders against thieves. The legislation welcomed by retailers. Our employees are asking for it, Californians are demanding it, and retailers want to be able to just sell our products. We want to deter retail theft from even coming into our stores. People need to, to be safe, they need to feel safe, and making sure that we're responsive um, to California is, is critical here, and this package, I think it's the job done. But there's no turning back the clock on the criminal justice reforms that have been enacted. There's a separate effort underway to repeal parts of Prop 47, which in 2014 increased the threshold for grand theft from $450 to $950. Assembly Speaker Robert Rivas says the new package of bills does not affect Prop 47. Uh, for us, it's understanding the root causes of this problem, which is complex. Uh, and for us, each one of these bills gets after those layers of complexity. Shoppers at Broadway Plaza and Walnut Creek say they welcome any crackdown on thieves. I think it's a great idea if they can work across the aisle to achieve anything. Um, you know, it doesn't happen very often these days. we got to do everything possible. I mean, I used to be part owner in a retail chain with my brother-in-law, and there was theft there. And what people don't realize is that it comes back to the consumer. Here at Broadway Plaza, thieves have gone into the Lululemon to steal things and then gone to other Lululemons across the Bay Area. The idea is to streamline any prosecution if these thieves are caught. In Walnut Creek, Henry Lee, KTVU, Fox 2 News. This is the 10 o'clock news on KTVU Fox 2. Tonight, a San Francisco family still searching for justice after their loved one was gunned down at a park exactly two years ago. We're not going to stop. We're going to keep going until they're behind bars. It's, it's really hard. I, I, I'm not able to, to process all these things. It's too much. A family struggling to move forward on the anniversary of the shooting that left two people dead and two others hurt. Good evening. I'm Greg Lee. And I'm Julie Hayner. San Francisco police have now more than doubled the reward with the hope it will lead to a break in this case. New at 10 tonight, KTVU's Amber Lee joins us now after talking with the family of one of the victims. Amber. Julia met with the family at the crime scene. The victim's mother and sister tell me they're grateful that police are now offering a reward of $250,000 for information leading to the conviction of those responsible for the double homicide. Family members say they will never give up their fight for justice. I miss him. Grief refuses to release its grip on the family of Brandon Cheese. He was shot and killed at Alice Chalmers Park in San Francisco's Crocker Amazon neighborhood. This boy was my day and night. His dream were my dreams. They destroy me. At the park, there are still bullet holes left by the shooting that happened April 3rd, 2022, around 4.30 on a Sunday afternoon. Family members say Cheese had been at a barbecue with friends and played basketball. They tell me he was at the entrance of the park, about to leave, when several people got out of a car and started shooting. Cheese and an acquaintance, Kieran Carlson, were killed. Two others were injured but survived. Police declined to say what the motive was. I don't believe my brother was a target at all. I'm not sure why this happened, but it shouldn't have happened. Police released images of the suspect vehicle, a silver Honda Accord. Blood out blood. The family says Cheese was focused on being a great father to his then two-year-old daughter. His parents created this memorial garden just outside the park. It's super painful. It feels like somebody's ripping my heart out of my chest to see him happy, full of life, and this is all we have left, the pictures. And cherished memories. Cheese worked as a barber and security guard. Relatives say he would give out free haircuts to the homeless. We need more community-based internships and organizations for the youth to help keep kids off the streets. Valerie Fernandez read a quote that Cheese wrote about fighting violence when she was his eighth grade teacher. She created posters to honor him. She says she never imagined he would be a victim of gun violence. It's disgusting. Um... And it hurts. Mom says she wants those responsible arrested and put behind bars. So they, we can have some kind of peace because this pain it will never go away. Never. Police declined to say if Cheese and the other man who was also killed were the intended targets. The lead investigator tells me he's followed up on leads, but that none has led to a break in the case. Family members hope the increased reward 
will bring answers and justice. Julie, Greg. Yeah, hopefully that reward in this report will lead to someone coming forward with some information. Amber, thank you. Thanks, Amber. New at five, police in San Jose arrested four suspected burglars who may have taken hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of property from storage units. Detectives began investigating the case in late December when a man attempted to burglarize a storage complex on Lincoln Avenue. An investigation revealed the suspect had stolen more than $400,000 in medical, excuse me, musical equipment and other property from multiple storage units. Police made four arrests in connection with the burglaries and said other illegal items were found in the suspect's possession. Honestly, everything that we discovered, that illegal narcotics, illegal firearm, a semi-automatic, as well as a high-capacity magazine, you know, those obviously aren't supposed to be in their possession. And so that's part of the picture we're trying to paint. Police say all four suspects were booked into the Santa Clara County main jail for various crimes, including burglary, conspiracy, grand theft, vandalism, and possession of stolen property. Thanks for watching KTVU Crime Files. See you next time.